Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back for yet another weekly market recap featuring my good friend, portfolio manager Lance <laughs> Roberts. Hey, Lance, how you doing? You're doing fine. It's Friday. It's Friday. All right. Um, well, look, a um, bit of a, let me put it this way. I interviewed Sven Henrik earlier this week, and he basically talked about the, the battle for control that's going on between bulls and bears right now. And it seems like that's been continuing right up to the end of uh, close of market on Friday here, um, where it's just getting, you know, pulled back and forth in both directions. It doesn't look like we've we've definitively broken out of Sven's uh, control zone yet that he's looked at. And just to remind folks, he is sort of saying if the if if we if the S P retests the four thousand level, that provides support. And you've said the same thing, Lance. Um, and, and the S P definitively bounces off of that. That sends a pretty strong green light that the S P could then run off to say like 43, 4400. However, if it breaks below that, especially if it breaks below 3950, Sven was saying, then the odds really open up for this thing to fall pretty far, like like a 20% fall to like 32, 32. So um it does seem like we're still in that rugby scrum right now, not not knowing exactly which way it's going to break. What are you seeing here as you watch this action? Um, you know, I don't know about the downside, you know, the, if you do break the 3950 level, which is kind of where that cluster of support is, then you're, you're probably going to retest the December lows below that you have the October lows. So, you, you know, and then you've got the four, the 200 week moving average just below that. So there's a ton of resist, a ton of support sitting, you know, just below those levels. So we may get a bit of a, a correction at that point, but uh, again, you know, that's if we get there, you know, right now, the market's been holding the 20 day moving average ever since really kind of the, the December lows. Um, you know, we tried to break below that on Friday. And as we're talking right now, the market's trying to climb back above that. And so it looks like at this moment, the market kind of closes even on Friday. Um, we're going to be sitting right on top of that support. So, you know, it's, it's you know, the market, despite the fact, you know, there's a lot of, you know, bullish negative news out there. Um, continues to act very bullishly. Uh, you know, cons- investor sentiment has gotten very bullish here. Um, uh, retail investors have dropped cash levels, increased equity levels. So, you know, there's definitely a flow of money into equities here, despite, you know, the, the Fed hiking interest rates and, and these type of things. So, you know, despite what the Fed says about wanting to be more aggressive about hiking rates, Bullard on uh, Thursday and uh, Loretta Meister both saying, hey, don't rule out a 50 basis point hike come uh, come the next meeting. And markets are like, yeah, we don't believe you. And so they sell off in the morning. And the important thing, though, is, is, look, when you're looking for bullish action, what you're looking for is a market that sells off and people buys it. And if you take a look at a chart for most of the last two weeks, we have green candles. In other words, the market's opening lower and then everybody's buying it. And we're getting these positive green candles on a candlestick chart almost every day. And that's 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 bullish bias, uh, you know, at work. Now, how long that lasts is a different story. Uh, we definitely have a sell signal in place right now in the market, so it suggests being a little bit more cautious. But a sell signal doesn't mean the markets have to have a correction. They can just go sideways for a period of time and work off a lot of that condition as well, which is kind of what the market's been doing for the last couple of weeks now. Can you talk more about that sell signal? So what, what exactly got tripped there? So we, we've got a couple. So we have a proprietary indicator that, that uses money flows into the markets. That's registered a sell signal. That signal is very, very good. And when you get that sell signal, more often than not, uh, you're going to get either a consolidation or decline in the market. Um, the MACD... Right. Which is, which, Sorry to interrupt, so this is an algorithm that you guys have coded that takes yeah. a bunch of different data points together and then, okay. Yeah, it's about it's about 10 different data points on how money flows into the markets or out of the markets. But an easy one to watch at home for for all you at home, you know, do it yourself. <laughs> um, th- just use the, the uh, MACD, which is the Moving Average Convergence Divergence Indicator. It also is a very good indicator for... Um, you know, kind of telling you when markets are, are really done. And what you're looking for for these signals in particular, if the signals occur within the middle of their range, and they're, they're an oscillator, so they move kind of to the top and then to the bottom. If you get a signal in the middle of the range, it's not as good. Um, those typically don't give you a really good signal one way or the other. But when you have a very elevated signal or a very low signal, 
we have a very elevated one right now. That's typically tends to be a better signal that suggests that markets are going to have a little bit of trouble making the move higher in the near term. Yeah, that, 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 that MACD then is kind of like your rubber band, right? When it's at the, the high end, it yeah. sort of suggests the band is stretched. Okay, yeah, more or less, yes. Because okay. basically it's using moving averages. So yeah, when prices get too far from their moving averages, that's kind of what develops. Okay. All right. So uh, so we've had this sell signal that the sell signal that's triggered, but we're still seeing as I was going to ask you in this battle for control, who seems to be having the upper hand right now? I guess I'd say from what you're saying, the bulls are in the sense that it hasn't been pulled below support. And even though we've had a number of days, uh, Friday ending the week included, where the markets sort of opened the lower, um, they kind of fought their way back to the end of the day to either unchanged or green. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that's, and, and that's again, that's kind of bullish, right? Because that means that you've got sellers that show buyers behind them and go take everything yourself. And so there, there, there's, there's, there's definitely buying demand coming into the markets, which, you know, that's, that's positive price action. So you want to definitely pay attention to that. Okay. Um, and so it's been interesting. You, you, you made mention to my next bullet here, which is, um, you know, we, we continue to have this game of chicken between the Fed and the markets. Um, the Fed keeps kind of ramping up. It's the severity of its, hey, you know, we're serious about higher for longer. And you just talked about um, two Fed, you know, senior executives, uh, Mester or Meister, I don't know how to pronounce her name, uh, and Bullard, who, who basically both said, hey, we might need to do 50 basis points next time. And this is very different from what the market was talking about um, you know, just a month ago, where they were speculating, it's just going to be one more, and then we're going to be done, right? Um, only 25 basis points. Um, all of a sudden, we're doing, we're, we're for sure doing more, and we might ramp back up to doing 50 basis points here. Bullard uh, took pains to talk about how um, both more hikes are needed, and, and maybe bigger hikes, but also bringing up the ghosts of 1970. And we just can't ever risk going back into that uh, type of scenario. So, you know, they're getting more and more um, inflammatory, I guess you will, in talking about how strong they're going to be. And the markets are still just shrugging it off. Yeah. Well, you know, again, this goes back to Powell. This is Powell's fault because, you know, it's great. Do you, you feel he was just not tough enough or what? Well, yeah, well, he didn't. I mean, you know, at the FOMC meeting and in the presser, uh, he said, oh, yeah, we don't really pay attention to monetary conditions short term. That was a huge mistake. Uh, when you've got a very bullish bias to the markets. And then when you had the opportunity to correct it at the economic uh, summit, you know, he didn't do it. And, you know, so he's let the market. And so right now, look, Powell is the guy, right? It doesn't really matter as much what Bullard says. It doesn't really matter that much what Meister says. It's what Powell says, because he's the head of the Fed. And he hasn't come out and corroborated, you know, these two statements. And, and this is important, too, because, look, you know, Bullard, Meister, the other members of the Fed, they trot those guys out ahead of meetings to send messages. That's all that's going on right now. They just don't randomly show up and start saying stuff. This is all coordinated. They're trying to talk the markets down some. Um, they need to have markets under control. And, and look, what Powell wants is he wants to control burn of asset prices. He needs to get asset prices down. He recognizes there's a valuation problem and he realizes there's an inflation problem. And you can't cure inflation with a strong consumer and you know consumer confidence is improving retail sales were strong even though that was a nominal basis number um but you know there's still you know there's there's not this big retrenchment that we're all expecting to come from the consumer in the economy to lower that demand to to burn off some of this excess inflation pressure and that's that's what they're worried about and Powell needs to get serious about making some if he wants to get this back under control and on his side of the ledger He's going to have to come out and start making some clear statements about monetary conditions matter. You bulls are messing it up and you're going to make me hype too much. <laughs> That's what, you know, he needs to get that message up. Well, it seems like that looks like what's sort of obviously happening yeah. to you and I right now. And hey, we could be wrong, but it certainly seems to. And I just surprised the market isn't seeing it the same way that we are. Not that it has to, but it just seems so obvious at this point. Um, one other thing too, though, is because of, of the higher CPI print or higher than expected CPI print um, and these statements, 
the market's pricing of where interest rates are likely headed is going up, right? Yeah. So the market is admitting to itself, okay, Fed fund rates probably going to go a little bit higher than we thought, but yet that's still not impacting valuations at all. Yeah. Well, I look, just don't understand that disconnect. Well, inflation expectations are rising too. I'm writing an article for Tuesday called the No. I'm, I'm reading the title, so I'm looking away from the camera. No landing scenario at odds with Fed's goals. That's it. so. This this piece will come out on Tuesday, but it, it goes into this whole conversation that we're having, discussing this fact. Look, inflation expectations are rising. The two-year Treasury yield is rising. Everything is telling you that interest rates are going up. And the, the Fed is not quitting anytime soon. And look, the two-year Treasury rate is a great proxy for the markets. So when you take it, start taking, thinking about you know, technology stocks as an example, technology stocks are priced on the discount to future cash flows. And so when you take a look at the discount rate to use on, the, on those cash flows over time, that's a two-year Treasury rate is a really good proxy used for that discount rate. So when that rate goes up, tech stocks should be going down. And, and they are. They have been the last couple of days. They've been under pressure. But, you know, again, not nearly to the degree that you would expect, given the magnitude of the rise in interest rates as of late, you know, inflation expectations rising. And the, and, and look, the, the strong employment report for January, the retail sales numbers, the CPI, PPI was very strong. Uh, so now you've got both CPI and PPI coming in, you know, yeah. pretty on the pretty hot side. Yeah, it's, we shouldn't say we shouldn't say strong. We should say hot. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely coming on the hot side. So, but the point is, is that that all tells you that this stuff that the Fed has been doing so far has not taken effect yet. But again, this this goes back to that lag effect that you and exactly. I um, you know, the problem is, is that lag effect hadn't caught up with the data. But right now, that data is saying, you know, all this stuff the Fed's done already, it hasn't affected anything yet. So, you know, we'll, <laughs> it could be a rapid collision when we get there, but, you know, the, the market's betting it's not. Well, so it's, I, I keep asking this question. I'm going to ask it one more <laughs> time in a slightly different way. Then I'm going to, I'm going to put up a chart here. Um, so, you know, what, what I just have such a hard time understanding is um, everything you just rattled off there, right? Higher inflation, uh, higher bond yields, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, you know, uh, higher, the Fed's going to keep hiking and continue quantitative tightening longer than the market was initially expecting. And the market is even admitting this to itself by saying, yep, we think, you know, rates, should, you know, bond, we're going to bring bond rates higher. Okay. We, we're going to bring our estimates for Fed funds rate higher, but it's not discounting valuations at all right now. Right. That, that just sounds crazy making to me. And here's sort of where I'm going with all this. Uh, I'm putting up a chart here, Lance. It's a chart off of Twitter. Um, I can't speak completely to the source and how this index is calculated, but it's a measure of global liquidity. And you can see that it was rising up until the end of 2021. And then it went down through October and then it came back up uh, to where we are now. And it's 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 too little data to really know for sure, but it looks like it's kind of maybe nosing over a little bit at this point in time. But in some ways, should we just forget everything else that we talk about every week and just look at a chart of global liquidity like is that all that matters could that be what explains what's going on here is it doesn't matter what's happening on the periphery just liquidity is increasing and that's all that drives asset prices that. look it's been that way for a decade now and this is why you know the, the this you know the, this is why i always talk about I, I told you did i tell you i'm writing an article called conviction did I tell you this already? You've told me you've written so many articles i can't keep them all straight <laughs> sorry i'm writing an article called conviction and uh, what, what the article's about is, is you know, investors, the, the biggest mistake investors make is to get convicted to one idea, right? Um, you know, the dollar's going to zero, the world's going to end, or, you know, the bull market's never going to stop going up, you know, whatever, whatever the, the thesis is. And when we get convicted to these ideas, it leads to really bad outcomes, you know, and, and a good example you can you can look at, for instance, uh, there was a, a call back in 2009 that emerging markets were basically going to dominate the world. You had to be, you know, forget U.S. stocks being emerging markets because they're going to take over the world. China, India, the BRICS. Remember this whole, you know, acronym we came up with. That was the worst. And, and if you had invested all your money into, into the BRIC countries, you didn't make very much money over the next 12 years compared to what you would have made putting all your money into the U.S. stock market. 
And, you know, and so getting convicted to, to these ideas can lead to a big loss of return over time when those theses don't play out as we expect. So the reason I say this is that we all have these ideas, right? And we're talking about, well, valuation says X, right? Valuations are high, so returns are going to be low. But to your point, all that's really mattered over the last 12 years has been liquidity. It's been zero interest rates and what the central banks are doing. And, you know, global liquidity matters. And Fed liquidity matters. There's, you know, uh, uh, right now is a good example of this. The market's going up. And if you take a look at Fed liquidity, which is the, the Fed's balance sheet minus the uh, treasury account, the general treasury account minus uh, reverse repo. So that number is actually going down, right? So because the Fed's reducing their balance sheet and, and we're taking liquidity out of the market in, for, in terms of uh, the, the reverse repo as well as the TGA account. So that's coming down and, and asset prices are going up. So there's this divergence between what stocks are doing and liquidity is doing. But eventually, those are going to marry back together. Either liquidity is going to come back ramping up sharp, sharply, which means something's broken in the economy and stocks will, will catch up with liquidity or vice versa. So, you know, to your point, all, all these other thesis and narratives and, and, and you and I banging our heads on the table trying to figure out, well, it just doesn't make any sense. Why is the market running up? Because the Fed's hiking rates. None of that makes any logical sense. It has everything to do with liquidity. And one thing that happened at the end of last year, everybody sold tech stocks for tax loss selling. They've all been having to buy them back after their 30-day window. Did you buy your miners back yet? Because that's where liquidity is coming from. Yeah. Um, well, your specific question about my miners, um, I, I am just starting a dollar cost averaging program because they're now back <laughs> to yeah. where I bought in. Um, yeah, but see, that, that's, but that's the point though, right? Now you're a marginal buyer. Right, you're not a right. marginal seller. You're a marginal buyer in the market. So then, that's exactly my point. I'm not. I'm not picking on your tax loss self. So. Um, oh, that's okay. Well, yeah, now, but, it now but, turned out to work. Uh, it's a good thing I waited now. But yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But this is what's happening. I mean, look, there's a ton of stocks out there right now. Roku and and um, DocuSign and a whole bunch of other ones. All the, all those kind of art. All the ones that got cremated last year. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting. They're up 100% from the lows. But if you look at a long term chart, you can barely see they've moved. Yeah. Right. But they've had 100% return or more since their October lows. And, and that's so now we've got all the speculation back in the market. People are chasing Bitcoin now. And, and you know, we're getting all that fervor back. And everybody's going, why do I care about the Fed? Stocks are going up. And this is really the binary decision that we've gotten into. It's it's no longer fundamentals support this or fundamentals don't support that. It's are stocks going up or not? That's the, that's the question. And if stocks are going up, we tell investors come ramping in as, as fast as they can. Right. Well, as I was saying, I've been saying on this program to you past a bunch of weeks, like that's the only bullish argument I can make is that stocks are going up, right? Um, so let, let's just dig into this liquidity just for a, a second, because it, it, I mean, it was, it was primal in terms of what the markets did from 2010 to 2021, which is pretty much every year, the central banks were putting more and more into the system. And then of course, with things like the pandemic, they put a ton more into the system, right? So um, we had the, the shutting off of fiscal and uh, monetary stimulus coming into 2022, which lo and behold, you know, makes sense, right? Asset prices went down because that that flood wasn't there anymore to support that rising tide wasn't there to support it. Um, what I and again, I, that chart I put up, I don't know exactly how it's calculated. And I'm trying to think. So what was it in October? that then started the the most recent surge that we've seen and i believe part of it is china right mm -hmm. china has thrown a fair amount of money in uh to its economy to, to reduce it with the reopening um i don't know how much of that that uh rise in the chart is due to just that alone um, i'm trying to think what else it could be yeah it could be money that came out for tax loss selling coming back in could be a contributor there you mentioned the the um TGA, the Treasury General Account. I actually, from what I've heard, I actually was thinking of it differently, which I've heard that that's almost sort of like a stealth QE, which is the Fed's not out there buying Treasury, but the Treasury kind of has this piggy bank, the TGA, yeah. that it's using to buy Treasuries out there. So that would actually be additive to li liquidity at this point in time. Um, so maybe those are the things that are driving it. Is it? Do, do you have a different well, opinion? Well, no, no. I think that's that's all. Those are all fair statements. So, a Bank of Japan, um, you know, they're trying to do yield curve control. That means they have to buy Treasuries to try to 
you know, um, you know, try to control how far the yield goes, whether they're successful in that or not. It's a different right, story. Yes. But, but, uh, but again, to your point, there, there's a lot of different facets that are going on into providing liquidity to the market. A big chunk of it's China, right? The China right. reopened. Right. And I guess just just to interject for a second, let you respond to, you know, several of the big players that we're adding are still withdrawing right now. Right. The Fed, the ECB. Right. So, you know, we do have a bunch of. Something yeah, yeah. has changed until they pivot, you know. But but again, you look, the, the Fed has, has. Yes, the Fed is doing QT, but. You know, they're supposed to be doing when they, you know, they announced QT back in January of last year, January, February last year. And they said, OK, we're going to start QT in June. We're going to start at 60 billion a month. And then we're going to go to 75 billion in the second month and 90, 90, 95 billion in the third month. Right. In August, there'd be at 95 billion a month. Well, so August, August, September, October, November, December is five months, 95 billion, 500 billion dollars plus 60 plus 75. They're barely making that pace. When you take a look at the roll off of their balance right. sheet. It has not been that aggressive. So yes, liquidity is coming out. Most of it's just letting treasuries, they, they bought a lot of short-term treasury bills on their books, three month, one year, two year type things. It's basically, they're just not replaced. Yeah, they, they let them mature and then they just they just disappear. Yeah, yeah, you just, they, yeah they give the money back and there you go. Uh, but, the, but the point is, is that, that they're not aggressively drawing down their balance sheet. And, and so that liquidity drain out of the, the economy is, is certainly there, but it's not aggressive yet. And, right. and the question but, is, at what point do they have to become more aggressive with it? Right. But the flip side is, is they're not adding, what was it? Forgetting the number now. What were they doing every month for 2021? Well, Pardon? they're supposed to be doing 95 billion. Oh, no, 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 not of QT. No, for 2021, what were they adding? I think it was 120 oh. billion they were adding every month. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so that's not going on. But, but anyways, I mean, it, it's, it's opaque. We don't really know. But it's important that we keep our eye on. And I'll see if I can find the source of this chart so we can bring it up in future uh, in future videos just to keep an eye on it. But it does. Um, well, you also need to be, out, pardon me? You also need to find out what, what it's comprised of, too. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I've hopefully put the caveat there that I don't yet know exactly what it is. But but that could be kind of the answer here that would make sense to me, which is like, you know, why are stocks going up and all this stuff's going on? Oh, because they're just still putting more water <laughs> in the bathtub here. Right. Whether I like it or not, it's just happening. OK, um, so um, let, let's get back on some numbers that we can punch into here for a second. You you, you mentioned them. So we, we talked about the jobs report last time you were on. Um, which was way better than anybody thought. Um, we think there's lots of issues with it, um, but better or worse, it's what the Fed is using to navigate by, right? Uh, but it, but a big part of that, that that beat of expectations, and this was like a 2X expectation beat, was um, seasonal adjustments. Right? Right. So you mentioned that we saw retail sales. Now, retail sales had kind of sucked coming into the end of last year. And then we just got the data for the January retail sales and they were pretty good, right? They were about 3%, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, but they were, um, let's see, they, they were seasonally adjusted, right? Um, which looks like it goosed the numbers just the way that it did with uh, jobs. And they weren't, that 3% is not inflation adjusted. So right. actually, if you take the inflation adjusted number, there, there really wasn't any growth in retail sales. <laughs> So again, it's sort of one of these deceptive headlines that maybe it's good for algos and for people to justify what they're doing, but I don't necessarily think it's representative of actual strength in the economy. No, no, absolutely right. But you know, this is but when we start talking about things like, you know, are we going to have a recession? No recession? You know, no landing, soft landing, that type of thing. So a couple of things to remember, and you know, I was talking about this on the radio show. I uh, think yeah, Thursday morning, uh, Mike and I were talking about this on our radio show is that, you know, if a car is going downhill, right? So you get the top of the hill, you put the car in neutral and have the car go downhill, right? Well, when the car gets up to speed going downhill and you slam and you put on the brakes, right? The car doesn't immediately stop. It takes a, it takes a bit to slow that momentum down to where the car stops, you know, somewhere on the hill. Well, it's the same thing with economic data. So as an example, the employment data, I'm actually talking about that in this weekend's newsletter um, on our website realinvestmentadvice.com, uh, shameless plug. So, Everybody should go. <laughs> but this weekend's newsletter, I'm actually touching on this, this piece of, of data because yes, the employment data for January is very good. However, if you look at the three-month average 
of employment. It's actually declining fairly sharply. Um, we had a very big run up in employment, obviously, after we shut down the economy, opened everything back up, everybody got hired back. So you had this big ramp up in employment. Now you've got this three month average, which kind of smooths out some of these numbers and some of the seasonal adjustments, but that's declining pretty sharply. However, the point is, is that data is still very positive. It's declining, that rate of momentum is slowing, but it's still positive. So it's got to slow a good bit more before we start going, oh my gosh, we're going to have a recession. And so here's the, the, and the same thing with retail sales. Retail sales have been flat for 10 months on an inflation adjusted basis. What does that mean? It means that consumers are spending more money to buy less stuff. They're just trying to get it, make ends meet, right? And so they're, they're not buying more stuff because after you adjust for inflation, retail sales are flat. They're just right. buying what they need to make ends meet. So here, here's the thing that's going to frustrate a lot of the bears is that we're going to have a recession. But what if it's not until 2024, mm -hmm. right? Um, because it takes time to slow that momentum down in the markets enough to get you there. And, and, you know, we talked about before, you know, last year, everybody was banking on a recession. I said, look, there's too many people expecting a recession. Right. That probably means it's not going to happen. I said right? that many, many times. Yes. Yeah. Everybody's there. Well, so now, now everybody's getting into the, hey, no recession, soft recession camp, right? That's actually good if you're bearish, because if you want a recession, that means that building up the odds, you can actually have one occur now because of psychology. But you know, now everybody's in this camp of no recession, which means that as that data continues to decline, that recession probably gets pushed out another quarter or two because again, consumer confidence is picking up, people are spending more money, they're feeling okay, markets are going up, 401k is better, so I can go out and I can buy stuff and I don't have to stress so much. So that could keep the market kind of chugging along here for a little bit longer. It, it might. And I think we talked about this last week, which is the consensus of the folks that I talked to on this channel. Kind of last quarter, it was pretty much, all right, and, and I think I, I like to call this the Zuloff theory, because this is what Felix Zuloff was saying. He said, I think the first half of the year is going to be pretty grim. And then I think the Fed's going to be forced to pivot. And then I think, you know, certain assets are going to start following suit and picking themselves up off the floor, you know, bonds first, precious metals first, stocks later type of deal in the second half of the year. To me, it feels like that the time shift is going on now where yeah. that that still may play out, but it's now going to be the second half of this year is looking more probable for the bad half and then early, you know, Q4 being the pivot and everything else. Um, who knows? I'm just saying this is what it sort of is, is, is looking and feeling like to me. Well, no, that's, um, and that kind of plays into the same thesis of just you need it, the data needs time for gravity to work on it. And, and these rate hikes, because of that lag effect, is the gravity, right? And it's going to take time for that lag effect of all these rate hikes to come in and, and, and drag that economic data lower and then make markets realize that, oh, crap, I'm not going to be able to make the earnings and profits I thought I was. And then prices can adjust lower for that. Yeah, and it very well could. And you talked about how, um, you know, we might even get somewhat decent corporate earnings, or at least not as abysmal corporate earnings as expected uh, in the next quarter or two, because companies are laying people off and doing cost cutting structures. So it'll it'll look good profitability wise in the short term at the expense of their longer term earning potential. Um, so we'll see. Um, but uh, OK, yeah. So anyways, we, and look, if 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 liquidity is as all important as as we think it could be here too you know this is the surge right now of china opening up and you know a few other things going on like we said and, and and maybe that you know needs time to kind of get to its ebb before this whole thing can roll over anyways too right so we got we got a lot of things going on that at least are seeing to delay the arrival of the recession that looked so clear to so many people, you know, at the end of last year coming into this one. That said, I do want to talk about a couple of, uh, I, I do want to still focus on where the data is, because of course, yes, we might get um, a reprieve from the governor for the time being, you know, uh, of, of the execution or the recession. Um, we need to use this time really well, right? So, so marking kind of where we are in the story is going to be really important. And, you know, you can talk more about this later, Lance, but I imagine you know, you would say from a financial planning standpoint, 
you don't necessarily want to use this term to go time to go hog wild, but it's maybe, you know, get some gains while you can get them, but also like get the rest of your portfolio in shape so that, you know, when the recession comes, you're, you're, you're well prepared for it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, look, um, I just want to mention it since we're in data, um, the industrial production data came out recently, uh, not very good. Right. And that that's a very important marker. That's a really kind of good um, finger on the pulse of the economy here. And uh, it's the weakest growth in two years. In total, it's up less than 1% over the past year. So that is showing, again, an economy that is slowing, right? Um, Philly, Fed, Philly Fed, exactly the same way. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So I now want to introduce a framework. Um, I can't remember if we've, if we've mentioned it or not. Um, but you're talking about how you were, you were, you know, in discussion with your colleague there, Mike Leibowitz. Um, he did a, a piece recently on hope, um, which is a framework developed by a guy named uh, Michael Cantro, who folks have suggested I get on this program. I think I'm going to try to get him. Um, I haven't reached out to him yet, but I will. Um, but the, the, the hope acronym sort of describes a sequence of how economic activity typically weakens before a recession. Um, so if we could go through them, it, it's, it's the H is housing. The O is new orders as measured by, uh, ISM, uh, Institute for supply management. Uh, the P is corporate profits and the E is employment. And, and that acronym sort of shows the progression, right? Is that you see the weakness happen in housing first, and then it's in orders and then it's in profits and then it's in employment. Can we just walk through this real quickly? And you sort of just touch on each. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and absolutely. This is and and the spur the 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 spur for that article came from Janet Yellen's comments recently that you know there's no recession in sight. And of course, she's also the one that said there was no more crisis in her lifetime in 2018. Right. It was immediately preceded, <laughs> followed by a 20 percent decline in the market, and then COVID. So yeah, you know, be careful what you wish for. Um, all right. Well, look. So when we talk about housing. Right. Yeah. So you and I talk about housing a lot in this program, uh, so we don't have to beat it to death here. Um, but clearly, very interest rate sensitive. Right. Mortgage rates are more than double where they were a year and a half ago. Um, may continue going higher from here if the Fed's going to keep hiking the way that it says it's going to. Um, and uh, we're seeing tons of, of markets across the country in decline now. Right. The peaks are in. The momentum is downward. Uh you know, some markets we could make arguments could could see really big declines, 30 plus percent type declines. In fact, the Bay Area here, although I haven't seen it manifest in my particular town, they're now saying the median price is down 35 percent from its height of last May, which is but or maybe March. Um, but bananas uh, to have a price decline that extreme that quickly. Again, like I said, I, I'm not seeing it necessarily here in my neighborhood yet. I was gonna say, I wish it would happen in Houston because they ain't moving here. So. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in a lot of the data that Michael showed here, you know, basically just adds when to the sales of what I'm saying here. I think maybe the one thing I'll put up here is he's got a chart on buying conditions for houses. Um, and this chart is the lowest reading it's had this in the data series, which goes back to the start of the 1960s, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, just real quick, you know, the, the, here. So, here's another interesting conundrum, right, about the housing data. Everything you just said is just right. Um, you know, big declines in houses. You know, affordability is is still just you know astronomical in terms of people being able to afford to buy a home. They can't, and yet the National Association of Home Builders, their sentiment is ticking up. Uh, the housing the housing builder stocks right have been going up. They're near all time highs. It's like what the hell is going on with this market? Because the the data doesn't suggest a turn higher in home builder sentiment, but their stock prices are going up, so they feel better about the market. But this goes back to the whole market environment, right? And it, it improves confidence, and you're seeing it right there. Yeah. So all right, but anyway, so. It, I agree. Here you say, here you say, an H is already that domino is falling. That, that's right. there. Yep. Okay. Okay. Now, so we get to the O part of this, which is the new orders. Um, and uh, I'm going to put up a chart here that uh, Michael has uh, in, in his report here. Um, but it shows that the ISM new orders survey is down to 42.5 percent. Uh, that's a often it's a level often associated with recessions here, right? So at this point, we're sort of talking correlation. 
Um, you and I were just talking about industrial production and a bunch of other indicators that are signs of the economy is kind of weaking, right? The heartbeat is slowing down here, right? So this one is basically saying, okay, you know, the the O domino hasn't toppled yet, but it the readings that we're seeing now are ones that are consistent with um, recession. So we would expect this domino to fall over relatively well, soon. Yeah, and you would also just expect it from the standpoint, look, the Fed's hiking rates. The goal of hiking rates is to slow economic demand. And that means that if we aren't buying as much, that means orders aren't getting placed. So uh, a couple of things to always watch for is always look at uh, order backlogs because it, when that basically reverses and there's no more order, you know, no more order backlog that tells you that, you know, you're really getting to the end of whatever growth cycle there was. So watch order backlogs and new orders are, are very telling as to how much demand there actually is. You know, one of the things that is interesting on the inflation front, by the way, that goes right into new orders is the inflation that's occurring in storage containers because all this inventory. You remember we had an inventory shortage <laughs> in 2020. Now, container containers are going up massively in price because there's such a demand for these uh, storage places to store all this excess inventory trying to get it sold. So funny. You, you Container rates went through the roof during the pandemic because people were desperate to get stuff shipped over. You couldn't get enough inventory. Then they cratered. Now they're going back up for the exact opposite reason. We get all this stuff that nobody wants and we got to store it somewhere, right? Exactly. Exactly. But I mean, but that that all feeds into new orders. And basically, if I've got a bunch of inventory, I don't need to order stuff. So it tells you that the economy is slowing down. The only question is, is, is how how far how bad does it get before it starts getting better? Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's get to the P part now, right? So, you know, once after somebody places an order, it becomes earnings on somebody's uh, income statement. Um, I'm going to put up a chart here that that Michael had shown. Um, this is a, a yield curve spread, the 10-year, three-month yield curve, and uh, EPS, earnings per share drawdowns uh, that we've seen in the past. And basically, the chart is saying, um, we're currently seeing a data or levels that indicate that a, a profit slump of 20 to 50 percent, uh, you know, we would expect to see uh, earnings drop by that much given the current inversion of this yield curve. So again, this is totally correlated. This is really predicting something to come that hasn't quite materialized yet. Um, but, you know, the data here is saying, hey, this P domino, you know, looks super shaky. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I mean, you know, profit margins, you know, got a huge boost from two really kind of, art, I shouldn't say artificial, but two inputs, right? So we shut down the economy, which we had no supply and we had no inventory, right? So inventories, as we just said, right? Inventories got wiped out. And so companies could charge an astronomical price for what goods they could sell. So that really boosted profit margins. At the same time, we laid off all the people, right? Because they couldn't, we couldn't have them work because of the pandemic. So now my payroll cost, the biggest cost of any business, goes virtually away in a lot of cases. Right. And, and we gave consumers a bunch of money to spend with stimulus. And, and most importantly, that's not just an and. That's the most important part is that we gave people $5 trillion to go spend. So now we have artificial demand, no supply, and reduced employment. And that is a beautiful formula for massive profit margins, which is exactly what happened for companies. So- the problem now is you've got just the inventory. You've got too much inventory, which means you're going to have to slash inventory costs. So that means deflation is going to start impacting profit margins. You've got high payroll costs now because everybody's been put back to work and nobody has money to spend. So, you know, to the P part, it's not, it, you know, that new orders, and that's what all this focus is on, those new orders aren't going to be passing through the system and, and when those don't pass through the system, this is going to start to impair earnings for companies. And again, when you're already trading at 29 times earnings for, for stocks, this is going to be a lot more problematic for markets to try to justify those valuations. All right. Um, super well said. Okay. So we've got these three dominoes, right? We've got okay. the H, the O, and the P. The right. H wow. is already in the process of falling over. The O and the P are like wobbling back and forth, right? Then we have the E in hope, right? And that is the bulwark right now. That's right. the domino that everybody is saying, that is strong. That's not going to fall, right? Yeah. Um, and Michael calls it here in his, his report here, Janet Yellen's false hope here, right? right. Um, but you and I have been talking about you know the declining fundamentals for the employment uh, situation for a long time. 
We've talked about how it is one of the last dominoes to fall because these employees are so expensive to find and hire and train and all that stuff that that until there's a gun to the head, companies don't want to um, let them go. And we've been tracking on a weekly basis all the layoffs that have been happening and the fact that they've been accelerating over the past number of quarters. So there's a lot there to say it is not nearly as um, bulletproof as I think a lot of the decision makers are trying to sell us that it is here. But it seems to be the last defense against the hope you know, dominoes all falling over together. Um, I'm just curious, uh, you know, you you were chatting with Michael when he created this, like how vulnerable are you seeing that E here right now? And and when, really when, if I can ask you to guess, when do you think we're, we're going to see the real cracks in it? Because yes, we're seeing, you know, some enthusiasm in the markets here and whatnot. But at the end of the day, you know, a company can only keep an employee for as long as they can afford to. At some point, they just got to cut them. Well, and at some point when retail spending slows down enough and you start and, and the, you know, so look, if you take a look at M2, right, that's mo- the measure of money supply. And we take a look at, you know, normally we look at the rate of change, right? And if you look at the rate of change in money supply, that's negative. So we had this huge spike in 2020, 2021 of the growth of money supply, which has now gone negative. And so there's a there's about a 12 month lead over that versus inflation. So that negative kind of drop in money supply is going to lead to lower rates of inflation. But if you take a look at M2 as a percentage of GDP, it's still pretty high. So in other words, we're still trying to, all that pig in the python that that was there is still working its way through the system. And so as that works out and consumers start spending less and earnings start to fall and profits become less, then companies get much more defensive and they eventually go, look, I can't keep you on. Adam, I love you. You're a great employee, but I can't keep you on just doing nothing, right? I got to let you go. And, and, and that we're going to get there. And that's probably going to be, you know, late second quarter, maybe early third quarter of this year. We'll start to see a much more aggressive take on, on the employment situation. But, you know, the thing about low employment, and this is Mike's point, is that it's a pre-recession indicator. Whenever you have the low levels of employment, everybody's like, oh, we've got the lowest level of employment since ABC. That's always been just prior to the start of a recession. Now you go, why is that? I mean, if you got low unemployment, everybody's working, why is that pre-recession? That's, that's, that, that should mean the economy's booming. Well, it's it's the Jack Nicholson movie. It's as good as it can get, right? You've got nowhere left to go. Nowhere to go but down, yeah. Yeah. And, and so as soon as so when everything is is running full throttle, everybody's overhired, everybody's at too much, then the economy starts to slow down and then you start to reverse that whole process. And then once people start losing their jobs, that's where they go, they quit spending and one thing leads to another and then you have a recession. So that's why it's three, six, nine months from the, the lowest levels of employment till the start of the recession. So, you know, third quarter of this year, fourth quarter of this year, I think we'll see a very different picture. Okay. And and this is why I'm going through all this, right? So we've got the framework, which, I mean, it's widely embraced out there, the HOPE framework, um, that says, look, this is the progression towards recession, right? And we just said that, okay, three of the dominoes are either fallen or are wobbling. The one that's really holding it all together is employment. You just said, yeah, and what's going to take down employment is going to be a drop-off in uh, consumer purchasing, right? Right. So there's an article that somebody wrote this week called Recession Signals Grow as Consumers Struggle to Pay Bills, right? It's I, know that guy. This... He's, he's that, I know that guy. He's a complete idiot. I wouldn't yeah, listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He <laughs> he's this guy named Lance Roberts. Uh, I don't know who this tool is, but he does make a pretty compelling argument here that uh, consumers are struggling to pay bills, right? Which obviously is going to lead to depressed consumer spending going forward if the trend continues. So I want to give you a chance to talk to any of the, the data or arguments you make in here, Lance, because um, you've got some great charts in here. Um, but, you know, look, if, if you're if you're pinning all your hopes on the employment bulwark holding the recession at bay, you got a ton of data in here that says, ah, it doesn't look like it's going to be able to stand up. Right. Well, no, I mean, it, it, look, this comes back to, you know, we talked about retail sales, right? And so let's go through the math real quick. So GDP is roughly, it's, it's about 68, 69%, but roughly 70% consumption, right? So personal consumption expenditures make up roughly about 70% of GDP. Retail sales make up 40% of GDP. Uh, uh, sorry, make up 40% of PCE, which is a big chunk of GDP. So 
retail sales are crucially important to the economy. And if you and what what this article is going through is going through kind of the breakdown of what's happening to the consumer. And they're having to ramp up credit card debt. And again, we go back to real retail sales, right? They're ramping up credit card debt to buy less stuff. They're just having to pay more for it. And, and this is why nominal retail sales look great. It's like, oh, wow, consumers just really hanging in there. 3% growth on retail sales. Yeah, well, there's a chart in here. Of, of, there's a chart in there of real retail sales. And basically 10 months just flatline. And what was interesting about that chart of real retail sales, when you look at it, it just falls off a cliff. It's like it's coming down and then it goes to zero, like one month and you have zero retail sales. And then it never got off the mat. It's like somebody literally just clocked it with a right hook and, that, and it was on the mat and it was over. Um, but you take a look at, at, at credit, <coughs> consumer credit. If you take there, there, we have a chart that I that I keep track of, and it looks at the ability for individuals to maintain their lifestyle. And what it looks at is the median kind of household income and standard of living going back to the 1960s. And then inflation adjusts that over time. And what's interesting is, is really two aspects. I've got a couple of different charts in that article that really show you the problem of where we are today. The first is if you look at consumer spending as a percentage of GDP, from 1980 to 2000, there was a very sharp ramp up in consumer spending as a percent of GDP. At the same time, of course, we we're also ramping up debt. Since 2000, consumer spending as a percent of GDP has gone flatline. So all that boost to economic growth that we had in the 80s and the 90s from expanding consumer spending because they were able to get credit cards for the first time and, and start leveraging up their lifestyle, really living beyond their means. They've been tapped out literally since 2000. And they keep going further into debt. They're dependent on cheap debt in order to sustain their lifestyle. And that's really the second chart that shows us the gap between what it takes to, to subsidize the standard of living and what they have in terms of incomes. And so when you look at the, the, the cost of living increases over time and that maintaining that standard of living, it until 2000, it required basically somebody could do it on their income and savings. They could basically sustain their lifestyle. Since 2000, they have had to go further and further into debt to sustain that same lifestyle. In other words, they can no longer do it just on income and savings. They have to have debt. And the, and the amount of that debt continues to grow every year. So they are requiring, they need low rates just to make ends meet. And of course, with higher interest rate, credit card rates are going up. That's going to divert more income from uh, the economy. Um, but the, the real problem here, and if you're looking for a recession signal, pay attention to the consumer because they drive economic expansion or economic contraction. It is all them. You know, con corporate, you know, we talk about business investment and all that. It's a small fraction of what happens in GDP. 70% of it all comes from the consumer. So just pay attention to what's happening on their end of it. Okay. All right. So great data, um, great <laughs> argument. Um, you know, as we look into our crystal ball for the future, right, of this year, the things that I see, I see as being additional weights on the backs of these overburdened consumers. I don't see much that's going to be lifting weights off of them and making their lives easier, right? Mm -hmm. I see a higher cost of capital going forward, right? Fed said, I'm going to continue hiking rates here. We're seeing, you know, bond yields go back up again. I just showed the chart of, of not only is the debt itself, the consumer credit uh, debt pile ballooned, but the rate they're being charged on it is at all-time record highs, right? Okay. Um, we talked about how, you know, real rates, uh, real wages uh, have been in decline for the past 21. I'm sure that's going to be 22 months pretty soon. Inflation is remaining hot and sticky. So there's not going to be any relief anytime soon, you know, at the grocery store, at the gas pump, rents, et cetera, right? So <clears throat> all the macro trends that I see or the preponderance of macro trends I see say this poor consumer is going to just have a tougher and tougher time as we go further into this year. Are there good arguments on the other side to say, hey, yeah, maybe, but but here's some things that look really great. Um, I didn't even mention layoffs. I didn't mention lower housing prices going forward. I didn't mention a, a, a stock market rollover, <laughs> all of which could happen. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know. You know, ask me the question again. Yeah. So just take, if you can, take the other side of that argument that says, hey, it's it might not be that bad for the, the consumer. Here are reasons to be hopeful going into the rest of this year. Yeah, I have a, I have a really tough time with that argument. <laughs> okay. uh, look, well, I'm not, you know, you, you do a good job of trying to make sure that we we look right. at all options here. We don't try to be overly bearish or fall. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 it's, no, it's a great point. I mean, so we have to just talk about logically is like, okay, so what can the consumer do? Well, the consumer just go further into debt. Right. Uh, you know, consumers are very crafty about coming up with ways to find money. And right. you know, we, we've seen like coming out of financial crisis. People True, but, cre- but creditors are crafty and in, in to, to try to not get screwed. <laughs> but I did beat creditors, too. This, this is true. But coming out of the financial crisis, we saw a lot of people, t- you know, claiming disability. And right. you know, that was a source of, of income for them. So consumers are always pretty crafty about coming up with ways to continue to spend well beyond their means and, and go further into debt. And, and, you know, home equity loans are ticking up, right? We're seeing more people take out home equity loans now, um, you know, just trying to do this. Um, I saw a very interesting article the other day. People are taking out loans from their 401k plan for Beyonce tickets. So, <laughs> and, and, oh, yeah, well, I know you're laughing. Wait, 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 wait. This is supposed to be the bullish side of the story. Well, no, it is. It, it, it's it's long term bearish, but it's sort of that you're, you're wanting a bullish argument for why the retail the consumer can hang in there because they do stupid stuff. People are selling their organs for cash. They're getting money. Yeah, hey, you know. It, look, uh, uh, this funny college story. My son called me the other day, and he's like, "Dad," he says, "Man," he says, "I, I got a I got a ticket." That I've got to go pay. It's one hundred and fifty dollars. He parked his car in the wrong spot apparently at school. And uh, he didn't realize it. Anyway, he got a ticket for it. I go, well, son, I said, I said, uh, you know, where are you going to come up with that money? Because I ain't paying it. And he's like, well, he says, I already got to cover debt. I said, what'd you do? He says, I went down and I sold plasma. Yeah. So, you know, 85 bucks a whack to sell plasma. So two, two donations and he was good to pay his ticket. But, but that's my point is that people will resort, maybe not to selling a kidney, but they will resort to pretty extreme <laughs> means uh, to make ends meet. But look, uh, so on the bullish side of this ledger, right, um, you know, things can happen that, you know, can still kind of keep this economy going. Maybe, maybe you know, we we never really hired, right, let me back that up real quick. During President Biden's State of the Union address, he talked about creating 12 million new jobs. We did not create 12 million new jobs. All we did was hire back 12 million people that we had laid off during the pandemic. So we didn't create new jobs. But what that means is, so, so on the positive side of this ledger, maybe, maybe we don't have this massive wave of layoffs because we didn't really overhire, except for some tech companies, they kind of went overboard. But in the manufacturing, industrial spaces, those type of things, we didn't really you know, overhire a whole bunch of people. We just put people back to work. So maybe we don't see these big layoffs. And if you don't have a lot of big layoffs, then people still have income, so they don't contract spending as much. So my point is, is that while the bullish picture is very hard to pick out, right? It's very hard to make a bullish case when you look at all this data. It doesn't mean that it can't happen. There's, you know, this 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 economy could 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 what we call muddle through uh, for a lot longer than you think. Yeah, and and I don't disagree that it couldn't happen, which is again why I'm trying to go through this exercise of just what what might I be blind to or we be blind to. I will poke some holes in, in that one idea. And I know you're just putting up trial balloons. Um, <laughs> but is is you know that economy oh, that you're so what now about, you become Biden, you're gonna shoot down all my balloons? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. With four hundred thousand dollars <laughs> sidewinder missiles for everyone. Um so uh but but that economy, let's call it right up until the pandemic economy, okay. right? yeah. was an economy that was addicted to, you know gazillions and stimulus, you know, every month and the lowest interest rates that we'd had in human history, right? You know, it, it, it we were supporting an economy that was really above our means with, with, with those types of policies, right? Which we don't have anymore, right? So anyways, yes, we should be open-minded that this could muddle through. I don't know how it's going to or could, but we got to be open to the fact that it could. Well, and again, to your point, though, right, the, and just, you know, part of that fuel for that muddle through is that we, again, when you look at money supplies and percent of GDP, that pig is still in the Python, right? It's still going through the Python. But that what that means is this, this economy can kind of muddle through a lot longer than you're looking at a lot of this data going, man, that just 
we should have a, we should already be in recession based on that data. Right. But we're not. And yet, and, you know, and, and you take a look at the Atlanta Fed GDP, it uh, was updated today. Right? It's, you know, two and a half or three percent. Gangbusters. Yeah, yeah, I don't get it, but OK. <laughs> but that's all this. That's real time data. It's going to get yep. adjusted now as it comes through. Yep. But the point is, is that you still have a lot of that money sitting in the economy that can allow this economy to remain stronger than you expect for longer than you can imagine. And as, as John Maynard Keynes once said, you know, the markets can remain illogical longer than you can remain solvent. And oh, so that's yeah. why we have to pay attention to what's going on with the markets. Yeah, it, it, totally agree. And it may be one argument that makes a little bit more sense to me is, you know, there's a lot of spending that has been approved, right, for the infrastructure bill yeah. that hasn't been able to get out in the real world yet for a variety of reasons, one of which is the debt ceiling is going to need to get raised. And it's funny, I haven't heard anything on that. Do you, do you know what's going on with the debt ceiling right now? Um, the Republicans are being uh, victimized because they're holding it hostage over wanting those silly things like spending cuts. Um so right now it was, it was headline news forever. I mean, everywhere. And then I'd say in the past two weeks, I don't know if I've heard boo about it. Yeah, and, and no, it hasn't. It, you haven't really heard much about it. But basically, it's in the standoff right now. Uh, we'll get up, you know, probably I would say, you know, late April, May, when we start getting towards that June, July deadline. This thing will ramp back up. Just everybody calm, just calm down. We're not going to default on anything. I saw an article out the other day. It's like, we're going to default on our debt. No, we're not going to default on yeah. our debt. We have a printing press. Solve, problem solved. Um, we are going to raise the debt ceiling and there's going to be a bunch of political drama over all this, but the, the world's not going to end. The dollar's not going to zero and we're not going to default on our debt. So just set that aside and let's focus on reality. Okay. All right. Well, look, I want to get to our rant for the week and then we'll get to your trades and then wrap things up. Um, this was an article that I really chuckled at, um, authored by a guy named Jack Rains at Young Money. Um, it's titled 11 Things That 0% Interest Rates Caused. Right. So I just talked earlier about how, you know, at the end of 2019, we, we, we had this economy that really was living above its means, right? Because we were artificially goosing things with 0% interest rates and then the stimulus that, that was being pumped in by the central banks. Um, but there are a couple of things here that I thought were instructional, but it might be fun just to mention them briefly one at a time, just so you can a, get a chuckle and you might want to add something in. So first, day trading is a career, right? <laughs> Folks were able to quit their job and, and you know open up a Robinhood account. And you know when everything's going up, Right, you can yeah. make money. Right, this, this isn't the first time though. Um, yeah. You know, 1999, we had people opening up, you know, floors of office bills. You know, we didn't have Robinhood back then, but we had the internet, and it was 14.4k dial-up. But you still had the internet. Right, um, right. But, but people would open up basically entire floors of office buildings and set up computers, and people come in and day trade. Uh, this is 1980, 1999. You know, during the dot com bust. So. You know, everything comes back around. Oh, it all comes back around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but this Although, is the first time, and yeah. it didn't exactly the last time. So. But this time it was on steroids because you could borrow yeah. super cheap to lever up, yeah. right? Absolutely. All right. All right. So you had day trading as a career. Um, you had SPACs, right? Mm -hmm. So you had the whole, you know, stupid SPAC thing of, hey, look, I'm going to go buy a private company um, with money you give me right now. I don't know what company. I don't know what it's going to be used for. Just give me a whole bunch of money and I'll figure it out. Right. Yeah. And, you know, that, that's I don't know how I missed that one. I, I should have <laughs> not like, hey, send me a hundred million dollars. I'm going to figure out something to do for you. Yeah, we'll do a wealthy on RIA SPAC the next time we get into a, a market mania. Absolutely. Um, the third one, and I don't mean to I don't mean to, um, you know, uh, denigrate anybody that, that that's a big fan of this, because I think the mission is, is noble, but ESG investing. Yep. Right. Um, there have been, um, I mean, one ESG investing mandates have distorted a lot of things in ways that you and I have kind of, you know, criticized in the past. Um, but there's been a ton of money that's gone into the space just because something had the ESG label on it, yep. right? Just like in the dot com, a ton of money went into things that just had dot com on the end, and you had these stories of companies that had absolutely nothing to do with the internet just putting dot com at the end of their their name, and all of a sudden their stock, you know, quintuples, right? Um, I do want to tell one story here. Um, so, uh, you know, part of this article is showing how all of these things have basically now met their demise or are meeting their demise now that interest rates are, you know, yeah. on their way to the Fed funds rate is on its way to 5% plus. Um, so I have a good friend who um, super connected in the social, socially responsible business world. 
got hired by one of the biggest ESG companies, uh, I don't know, probably eight, nine months ago or so, uh, and um, has been a, a big executive there. And when he joined, I mean, they just could not answer the phones fast enough. I mean, just business just getting thrown at them. Um, and basically, this company provides the, the big data, uh, combines a couple of different buzzwords, but the big data to let companies know uh, and track and value their ESG efforts so they can start reporting to shareholders in the media, oh, okay, we delivered X amount of incremental value on ESG mandates going forward, right? So if you're a big company like, I don't know, Nike or Ford, you use their data to be able to tell the world, you know, the value that your ESG efforts are, are creating. Um <clears throat> I mean, I saw him as recently as as you know, coming into was well, certainly Thanksgiving, and he was like, "Yeah, it's been the best thing ever. I'm building my team. It's just you know, we, we, again, we demand out the wazoo." Saw him about two weeks ago, and he said, "Oh my God, it's just could not be more completely different." And I'm having to look at who I got to let go on my team, and I hope I keep my job. And it's just the the phones just stopped. And and reason why all this is instructive is because we've talked about this recently on this channel with a few other people. When you start getting uh, concerned about financial survival, you just quickly descend Maslow's hierarchy of needs when it comes to financial issues, right? And and a lot of kind of nobility, a lot of stuff that we couldn't track, but we thought we were doing good, but we weren't sure. All that stuff immediately gets tossed out the window uh, or out the basket because you're just trying to keep the balloon afloat at that point in time. And I, I think we're seeing a lot in the, in the ESG yeah. world of this type of correction. Absolutely. Well, you know, I wrote I wrote two articles about the ESG the ESG scam uh, on our website at realinvestmentadvice.com. If you go to realinvestmentadvice.com, there's a search bar at the top. Just put ESG in, and I've got a couple articles about the scam of this. And you know, BlackRock. Let, let, let's say let's say the way it can be scammed. I don't I don't no, want to no, no, I don't want to enrage people. Well, I do. I want to enrage you, okay? <laughs> because the, the whole thesis behind the ESG. Look, if investing in the stock, right? If I buy Apple stock from Adam. It has no no impact on the economy whatsoever, period, none. So buying an ESG ETF and thinking you're making a difference in the world, you're not. It's just oh. you're simply exchanging money with another person. Um, BlackRock, I agree with that point. That's just a cash yeah, money transfer. Yeah, exactly. And that's and that's BlackRock. And BlackRock's the leader of this whole uh, investing scam. So BlackRock charges four times as much for an ESG ETF versus an S&P 500 ETF. And the correlation of performance is 99.2%. In fact, the top 10 holdings are identical except for one, which BlackRock gets substituted their company stock in the top 10 holdings of the ETF. So every time you buy that ETF, it funds BlackRock stock. It is all a money grab. And that's and this is why now states like Florida, Texas, others are going you know, no, we're no ESG. If you're if you're promoting ESG, you don't get to invest in our pension funds and, and you don't get to manage that pension fund money. And that's why now you're seeing people back off of this. Um, even BlackRock is now backed off because they were going to lose billions of dollars of money management from from uh, Florida pension funds over this. But, you know, this is the you know, the important thing as an, an, an investor, as we're looking at markets and again, all these themes come along and right. So climate change comes along. And so now Wall Street says, hey, here's a product I can sell. Let's come up with all these nebulous ESG things that we can't even we can't even quantify half of these ESG measures. We don't even know how to measure like valuations, cash flow, those things we can measure. You want to understand the, the balance sheet of a, of a company? That's easy to do. Quant quantitatively and qualitatively measure these ESG factors are nearly impossible. And then you have things like carbon credits. There's a great article out in the Wall Street Journal last week of a company that's come out with this new device. And what this device does is it pulls in ambient air, sucks out CO2, and then pushes out CO2-free air. Then it heats up, crystallizes the CO2, and then pumps it underground. So now, this is carbon credits. They then sell to companies like Microsoft. If you don't understand carbon credits, this is what, how it works. I'm a coal company and I produce coal the old way, right? I don't do clean coal. I do old coal. And old coal is super nasty, right? It's terrible for the environment. But my company, in terms of ESG rankings, A plus. Why? Because I buy carbon credits to offset all of my carbon right. footprint. 
I'm still polluting the atmosphere like crazy. That's why it's a scam. That I'm not cleaning up the environment. All I'm doing is shifting capital between rich people. <laughs> and so ESG is great for making wealthy people wealthy. Think about this. If we didn't do climate change, and if we didn't have this huge demand to get away from gas powered cars, Elon Musk would not be the richest person in the world, right? So this, this whole idea of climate change has funneled money through Wall Street because Wall Street said, hey, here's a massive product that I can sell at a profit, and they've done a great job with it. Here's the beautiful thing about that gadget I was telling you, right? So Adam, you're a smart guy. You went to Stanford, right? This product takes CO2 out of the air, puts out free air, right? And then crystallizes, which requires energy, by the way. I was going to say, and, and how is that energy being provided? <laughs> well, yeah, but that's one thing. But what else, what else, what product could you and I come out with that will do exactly the same thing? What would take CO2 out of the air and, and produce oxygen in the world? I mean, maybe a plant, like a uh, yeah, plant. <laughs> exactly. So I'm gonna. I've, I put out a tweet the other day. I said I've, I've come out with a new product that will compete with this company. All I got to do is figure out how to get carbon credits for it. Bonsai trees. We're just gonna produce boxes <laughs> and sell them to people. <laughs> but the, the point about all this is, 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 is you got to be careful when Wall Street starts promoting something. SPACs, IPOs, you know, ESG, all these type of things. Why does, why does Wall Street do an IPO? Does Wall Street really want to give you something at a gift? Are they really no, trying to- because it can make money. No, they're, they're selling, they're, they invested in this company. They're selling it to you at a massive premium, right? And you're, and you're out there going, yeah, I'll buy it. Yeah, you know, pay attention to what you're buying, right? Understand your product that you're being sold and understand if it's really what it is that you're being told. It's like NFTs, right? So it's a whole nother thing. Uh, I, I, I got to grab this from you. One Sorry, you just got me on a huge rant. So yeah, there, I know. A rant and, and we're, we only finished three of the 11 and you just <laughs> well, mentioned no, NFTs, true. which is number six. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but the key thing I want to mention is, is yes, Wall Street will do all that stuff because obviously it exists to serve itself, but it's the conditions that monetary Absolutely. policy created to let Wall Street have this bonanza, right? It's right, these 0% have greed. interest rates, right? You, have, you gotta have free money and you have to have greed and then you right. can sell anything to anybody. There's a sucker right. every minute they got free money. All right, well, look, I gotta move on because no. you, whoever we didn't lose who got offended <laughs> on, on your rant there, you're, you're gonna go off on this next one too, which is venture capital subsidized lifestyles, right? right? So there's so many services out there right now still that are basically being kept alive by, you know, VC money that they're these great services we love, right? But they're just not sustainable, right? And they're just going to start dying off. And, and as you were talking, I had to run away and, and grab this. This, my, my wife briefly back in 1999 uh, worked for WebVan. Um, so this is WebVan's, this is the champagne they gave all their employees for their, their IPO when they went uh, live with this ticker. Uh, and, uh, you know, for those that don't remember Webvan, um, it was kind of the precursor, I guess, to like say Uber Eats or uh, Peapod or whatever. It was, it was basically home grocery delivery, right? And it was ferociously unprofitable. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, there are companies now that have evolved the model and maybe there are some that are going to be sustainable in terms of their business models. But this was just a money furnace, um, but people got to enjoy home delivery of groceries, in, at least in Silicon Valley and a few other locations, you know, for about a year and a half, two years, because just all this venture money was just getting burned, you know, figuring out that it was unprofitable. You remember uh, Cosmo.com, which was the, yeah. the bicycle courier service. I mean, you guys that would basically like call up Cosmo and order like a candy bar, right? <laughs> You'd basically get a live person, go into a store, buy a candy bar bike halfway across the city and hand this. I mean, there was just no way it was ever going to make any money, but people got to live on it and enjoy it up until the VCs finally said, okay, we're cutting this off, right? So again, the well, same thing happened here. Yeah, you know, I Uber did a, is a great example. I did, a, I did a presentation for a mergers and acquisition business in the, and at the very end of 2022. It's like November of 20, uh, sorry, 2021, right? So it's the height of all this money. And they were like, man, there's just so much money. If you've got any deal, I don't even care if it's a good deal, we can get it out to market because there's just literally money laying in the gutters. We just have to just go pick it up with a bucket and we can pretty much fund anything you want to get funded. And I was like, right there, was, as these people were talking about this, I was like, yeah, this, I, I called my partner. That's <laughs> it. We got to start selling a lot of stuff. Yeah. And 
And, and that was one of the, that, that was actually, that was November. And we went to 35% cash at the end of December. Um, and that was one of the big reasons is because it was just that type of environment. There was so much money. People were funding just stupid stuff across the board. And then again, it goes back to ESG and NFTs and, and all this other stuff, right? And you just, and you just, uh, SPACs and all, you know, these, these other things. But that's what happens when you have all this money chasing too few assets. And when there's when you have that environment, then Wall Street's going to create product for you. It doesn't matter if it's good product. And that's the that's the the risk that you've got to inherently understand is am I buying a good product, right? Am I buying something that's actually got value or not? So um, I'm going to jump over number five, which is Miami, which they're just saying like there's no re there's no way that Miami really deserves to like supplant New York as the future of commerce, um, except maybe being located in a state that maybe it has a little bit more sanity than New York, but but I'll leave that to people's it's got more sunshine. <laughs> but uh, it's warmer for sure, better beaches. Um, but NFTs is number six, right? Yes. Um, I mean, the whole board eight club, right? The whole, you know, NFT unique image. And look, I'm not saying that there aren't potential applications of that technology somewhere in the future, but the way in which it initially came to market for people just spending bazillions of dollars on uh, digital images uh, that really have no perceived yep. long lasting value is sort of the height of what you were just talking about there, Lance, yeah. right? Well, just like the, the, the original tweet from Jack Dorsey on Twitter. Um, somebody bought that for, I can't remember, several, it was like $800,000 or something like that. You know, real estate, uh, right. virtual the, real estate getting bought or sold. And there was an interesting chart out um, uh, on the daily shot. I think it was on Tuesday or Wednesday uh, of this week. I can't remember. Um, but it just showed the value of NFTs, which have basically gone to zero. Um, you yeah. know, it was this huge spike. And then after the money ran out, there's just been no, there's, there's no demand for NFTs and the value has basically gone to virtually zero. Yeah. And, and a lot of suspicion that the, the transactions that did happen were money laundering anyways. Right. Oh yeah. 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 Well, that was, um, you know, that, that was one of the things that it was rumored about Sam Bankman Freed when, you know, he was trying to move money out is that he was using NFTs to, to basically, you know, get money sheltered out to different places. And, and that's where you go, look, I've got this NFT, you buy it from me for $10 million and then I'll give right. you nine million back, right? You know, whatever. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to jump over number seven here too, although I'm sure you could rail on it. It's a adjusted EBITDA. Oh right? yeah. <laughs> it, it's basically a way to just sort of, you know, like you like to rant on pro formas, right? You know, yeah. you yes, I my company lost money technically, but you know, if you, Look at the adjusted EBITDA, which is the way I like to calculate it. Oh my God, it's the world's best business, right? Yeah, I, I have a I have a very simple one for this one. It's short, it's quick, to the point. It's the it's the Charlie Munger definition of EBITDA. EBITDA is bullshit. That is Charlie Munger's quote. Okay, <laughs> the period. <laughs> There's nothing period. else after. That's it. it that's, that's it. it. That's it. Said, Charlie Munger does. If you ever use EBITDA in any of your analysis, you're wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, look, number eight. And this is going to hit some people hard, maybe, but it's work-life balance, um, yeah. where you know um, it, the, the way I sort of look at this, and I don't mean to sound callous, but it's like just because you want something doesn't mean you're going to get it, right? And of course, we all want work-life balance. And my recommendation to everybody would be, you know, pick a career, stick in a career that gives you the work-life balance that you want. But you know, as I talked earlier about going into recession, where you just you just drive down Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you just get to the survival part of things. Um, you know, talking to your employer about, I really need some more work-life balance when he's basically saying, how do I keep this business operational next week? You know, it's not going to be a discussion that goes well for you. And a lot of people in a, in a you know, recessionary environment are just going to have to honestly take trade-offs that they don't want. And I'm not I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying you have to like it. I don't wish it on anybody. You should try to avoid it. But I just think you have to be aware of that. And if you're young enough to have not had to go through a real recession yet, um, it's a different story than the past 10 years, right? I, I keep talking about my, my neighbor at Rivian. She worked at Tesla, which is you know, arguably in today's environment, you know, one of the most draconian places to work. She went to Rivian, which was the exact opposite, right? It's all flowers and sunshines, and every employee is told that they're a perfect special snowflake, and there are, you know, massage chairs. I mean, she was saying like nobody would question you if you um, wanted to take your team out for dinner or needed to take a business trip. They wouldn't question what 
class of, of airfare you flew, business, eh, no one's going to question what hotel you stayed in, how much you took the team out for dinner. Like you, you basically had blank checks for everybody, right? Which you can get away with in a brand new company that's run by folks that haven't run a big organization before that investors are just throwing way too much money at. But once the rubber meets the road, as it now is there, and Rivian's gone through several layoffs so far already, um, she just said it's like totally night and day. And there's like PTSD amongst a lot of the early employees because they're like, this isn't what I'm used to, right? You know, I'm used to this company coddling me and giving me all these perks. And now basically they're taking away my snacks. And, you know, they're now telling me I've actually got to show why I'm making a, you know, a profit, a return off of the, you know, investment that I'm making and asking for for my department. So my, my point here is, is just that um, you really got to gird yourself for the reality of, of you know, a lot of belt tightening, especially if you work for, you know, an employer uh, who is vulnerable to a lot of the macro issues that you and I have been talking about this whole interview, Lance. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, you know, the, the work-life balance is your choice. And at the end of the day, you know, when it, and I, I just saw a video <clears throat> earlier this week, young kid, you know, probably in his mid twenties talking about, you know, long hair and, you know, beard, the whole nine yards. And he's like, I don't understand why I have to work. He says, you know, America should provide the basics of life. I should have food, housing, health care that should all be provided for me. And, you know, I'm sitting there going, that sounds great, except I'm the one providing that for you, right? right so right. What's, what's, what's the engine that enables all that? Yeah, exactly. yeah. It just, yeah. You know, this stuff just doesn't show up somewhere. But, you know, the point is, is you can have work-life balance, you know, and I was talking about, I was actually having this conversation with my daughter uh, just the other day, because, you know, she's in college trying to figure out what career she wants to do and, and you know, going through that, you know, early college phase of, you know, which major do I, do I settle on? And I was like, you know, she's, she's like, oh, I want to have a nice apartment and I want a nice car and I want these things. Right. But I, you know, I want to have lots of flexibility. I want to travel and do all these things. And I said, well, those things don't necessarily all equate to each other in order to have the travel, the nice car, or the apartment, that's going to require you to do a lot of work. So, you know, how, how much you want to succeed and how much money you want to make is going to be a direct correlation to how much work you put into it. There's not a there's no math that says I can work 30 hours a week and build a tremendous amount of wealth. That just doesn't occur when you're working for somebody else. Now, if you're working for yourself, it's possible, right? So, but that's a different conversation we'll have. Yep. But if you're working for the man, right? Um, it's there is a direct correlation to the effort you put in versus the rewards that you get out of it. And that's going to directly impact your future. And so, you know, you can choose. Look, if you go, I lived in Europe for a long time and, you know, their work life balance is awesome, but they don't work to have this excessive lifestyle that they live way beyond their means. You know, right. housing is very modest, cars are very modest, clothing is very modest. And they work to live. They don't live to work. So they work just enough to support that lifestyle. They don't really care much about anything. They don't care about big fat retirement accounts and all those type of things. They work for that life balance. And that's their culture. Our culture is very different here. And, and so if you want the type of lifestyle that you just want to work so you can pay for your lifestyle, you know, you need to settle into that lifestyle. But it's not going to be mansions and fast cars and private jets. Yeah, I totally agree. Have the same, just literally had the same conversation with my college daughter. Um, I do want to note that uh, you're absolutely right about Europe, although they do care um, in the sense that, you know, some of these uh, national pensions and whatnot that are beginning to run out of money in certain <laughs> cases, they get understandably very pissed when they're told, oh, wait a minute, you know, we're, we're not going to give you what we, we promised we would. Yeah. Um, all right, look, so uh, there were the, the remaining ones um, were one was the metaverse. Enough said. Um, one was Kathy Wood. Enough said. Um, the last one, the last one is worth talking about for a second, uh, which related to what we we're just talking about. But it's called dudes working seven. Se sorry, dudes working seven different remote jobs. Yep. Um, you know, when you're working in an office, you really kind of can't get away with with doing you know side hustles, um, at least during your your office hours. Um, but with the whole you know work from home and everything, tons of stories, and there's a really funny one here. You know, about an engineer who, um, what is it? I think he said he, uh, he has 10 fully remote engineering jobs. And he says the bar is so low for hiring engineers, like because this company is 
you know, up until recently before they started lay layoffs, you know, just were desperate for him. Uh, so low oversight's non-existent. So he's currently on a one or when he wrote this um, eight months ago, he was currently on a 1.5 million run rate for comp this year. Right. So he basically had relations or employment relations with 10 different companies who didn't know about the other nine. Right. Yeah. And he just figured I'll just kind of do the minimal amount of programming. And, you know, even if a couple of these guys figure out, I'm still going to have seven jobs left over <laughs> yeah. and just milking the system. Right. Yeah, no, it happened to us. We actually had an employee that was, you know, we were during COVID. Um, we, you know, had everybody working at home and, you know, we were just like everybody else had shut down the office for the most part. And we couldn't figure out what there was something that just wasn't quite right. And, and there, you know, because she would disappear for long periods of time and then she'd show back up and, and do work for us and, and those type of things. And then one day by accident, she emailed all the work for other job to us. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like, whoops. But yeah, you know, it's, it's easy to do when, when, you know, there's no really accountability. I think, and I think this is also why, you know, this whole work from home thing, I think eventually dies to eventual death. A couple of reasons is that is one, right? To get more control over the employees. And I think there's going to be a demand. You're starting to see more companies do this, Google and others saying, hey, got to come back to the office now. Yep. Um, I think that's going to be one part. The other part is, is that these companies have huge expenses in office buildings that they own and they're not getting utilized. So I think at some point it's like, we're paying all this money, get back to the damn office and put some bodies in some seats. Probably the key thing I just want to underscore about really all this, right, is um, when there are deformations, uh, everybody adjusts. You said, you know, humans are very adaptive, right? They adjust to uh, an artificial reality, right? So that when the deformations clear from the system, that artificial reality doesn't hold anymore, right? And and the Fed uh, and a number of other players have distorted the financial markets. Uh, they distorted the economy with things like 0% interest rates for as long as they had them. Um, and, and we're beginning to, like you said, you know, a lot of these things, they're, they're old. We've seen them before, right? Um, you know, we're going to go back to the way that things used to be now with a lot of the deformations beginning to bleed out of the system. And it's going to be a rude awakening for a lot of people that have really adapted to this artificial reality, right? Oh, I, I, I work from home and I don't get any really oversight, right? And my company has been really generous because it's been flush with VC capital until recently, right? And it's just going to be this really rude awakening on a whole bunch of factors. And, and I don't mean just for people who are pampered by a lot of the example, like a lot of the examples we talked about here. Just, you know, we talked earlier, just, you know, yeah, you know, your big challenge might be just freaking holding on to your job, right? Forget about know, frills. Yeah, you know, it's interesting talking about VCs as well. There's a new term that's now coming out called uh, zombie venture, zombie VCs. I don't know if you've heard about this. No, ZVC? But, uh, yeah, well, and, and the, the interesting ZVC. thing about that is, is that it's that's also a function of all this easy money and low interest rates, right? There was all these VC companies that popped up and they went and made bad investments into poor quality companies that, haven't done well and now aren't going to go well. They're not going to get public. They're, they didn't, you know, they didn't mature like they were expected to. And so there's a lot of these VC companies that are now just kind of in zombie mode. And what they're trying to do is just hold on to these investments as long as they can, pay them out as much as they can, and eventually they'll wind down and go to zero. But basically, they're just on, on a negative death spiral at this point because the investments they made are now no longer valid. Well, and what's interesting about that is the VC industry is, is kind of a bit of a winner take all, where in other words, there's a few really big firms that everybody wants to get funded by. So everybody goes to them first. So they kind of get the pick of the litter. So if you're not a top tier VC, the deals that come your way tend to be second tier at best, right? So these companies are probably over, yeah, but they're probably overstocked with a lot of these poor performing companies, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and but, also, but again, to, but again, but again, that goes back to too much money chasing too few assets. Well, exactly. Right? Yeah. And 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 again, this zero percent interest rate environment. There's a lot of just zombie corporations out there. Forget whether they've got VC funding or not, right? And and in theory, you know, and there's a lot of estimates about how much of them there are. But we've heard twenty percent or so of the corporate fleet bandied about. You know, interest rates stay up as high as we're talking about here. Right. I mean, you could see a fifth of the corporate fleet kind of just croak over the next year or two. Right. Not saying it's going to, but you could. Right. So, again, that's just another example of like 
we've gotten used to them being around. They, we've heard about it forever, but they haven't died off. So is it really something we have to worry about? We very well may find ourselves very quickly having to worry about it, right? No, no, so, absolutely right. Yeah. All right. Well, look, um, in wrapping up here then, Lance, um, let's talk about trades. So um, we've got this battle for control going on. If memory serves, you had been kind of waiting for the dust to settle a little bit, but but what have you done over the past week, if anything? Nothing. Uh, this past week, we didn't really do anything. Um, we've got two two things we're working on right now. Is one is that interest rates are finally moving back in our direction. Uh, we want to increase the duration of our bond portfolio. So we've been waiting for uh, the right opportunity to add to our longer duration bonds. Interest rates finally moving in that direction. So I think in the next month or two, we're probably going to get that kind of buying opportunity to to pretty sharply increase our duration or bond portfolio. Because if you're going to get a recession, rates are going to come down. So that's just a function of, of time. But we need the right entry point. I think we're going to get there. Um, the other side of this is, is that you know we've been shifting into a bit more valuation and a bit more um, low volatility type stocks with big dividends. We haven't done anything lately. We sold about 8% of our portfolio ahead of the FOMC meeting because of the inflation print, the employment, all that was coming along. Um, we've got the, the sell signal in as well. So that just calls for reduced equity risk. So once we work through the cycle, then we're going to put some more capital back to work on the equity side. But that could be another two, three weeks. All right. Um, thanks. And look, you reminded me of a question I wanted to ask you earlier. Um, so give me the short answer here. We can pick it up later in next week's one if you want to. Um, but I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, okay. And look, I, I, you know, part of this program is asking you to kind of prognosticate with imperfect data. So, you know, this you're the audible, you can make any audible changes you want. Yeah, no worries, no worries. But I remember last summer, uh, you being one of the guys I talked to who said, I don't even think the Fed's going to get above 3% and hiking the yep. Fed funds rate, right? How high do you think the Fed's going to go now? How high do you think that that's going to go? I can't see them getting above five, five and a quarter, but, you know, it's, it's, look, you know, the reason I said three last year is, and, and that was his history, right? History says that 3%, that's the long-term downtrend line, et cetera. And, and probably three is where they should have stopped. I still, I'm still of the camp that they've hiked. They're over tightening. Yeah. And this is, they're going to, they're going to really regret these last, you know, 150 basis points, but nonetheless, uh, no, uh, you know, right now, you know, we're looking at three more Fed rate hikes between now and June. So you're talking somewhere around five and a quarter, could go as high as five and a half percent. Um, but again, the, the every time they hike, that's just increasing the odds that something's going to break. Okay. All right. Yeah. I just, I, I was, I was kind of reflecting back then. I was like, yeah, that's right. I haven't really asked Lance about that, but no, that's yeah. Right. And, I, and I'm just curious, because I'm sure people are wondering this, what would be at the top of your list of what you would tribute the Fed being able to have gone a lot higher for a lot longer than you thought was possible? Um, too much money. This goes back to money in the system. That yeah, just the stimulus was so great that it just, yeah, that, that it, pig was so freaking huge. It just takes yeah, longer and, and it just And it's taken longer for things to get impacted by, you know, if, if the Fed had gotten to 3% and then we started seeing the data really come down, they probably would have stopped at three and a half or four, right? But it just hasn't. And, and so, and that's because of that pig and the Python. So that just, you know, trying to account for the, the gargantuan size of that monetary input was very difficult. So, you know, and again, it's it's lasted a lot longer than I think anybody would have expected. All righty. OK, well, look, folks, um, uh, you know, trying to figure out how much pig is left in the Python and how much time do we have and what's going to happen after that. That's a huge focus of the upcoming Wealthy on Spring Conference, which is next month, Saturday, March 18th. A reminder, uh, if you can't watch the event live, uh, but you're interested in seeing it, uh, everybody who registers is going to get a replay video of replay videos of all the presentations, all the live Q&A, the entire event. So if you can't watch for that whole day, or you can't even watch that day, uh, you're going to get those replay videos and you can watch them whenever you want to your heart's content. Um, I won't go through the august list of um, faculty that we have lined up for it only because I've mentioned it on many previous videos in the past, but it's a, a fantastic list that keeps getting uh, longer and better. Uh, for the latest details, as well as to register for the event and lock in the early bird price discount that's still in effect, just go to Wealthion.com slash conference. Um, all right. And look, uh, I think Lance and I did a great job again this week uh, in terms of just underscoring the main mission behind this uh, channel, 
which is, look, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, and for the average investor who oftentimes has a real life and has much more important things to worry about, like living your life, managing your family, not getting laid off at your, your job if your company is beginning to suffer from some of the issues we talked about here, um, it can be really, really hard uh, to be a good steward of your financial capital through really highly uncertain and, and potentially volatile periods like this. So we recommend that you work under the guidance of a professional financial advisor who understands all the macro issues that Lance and I talked about here, can come up with a personalized plan for you, but then also execute that plan for you as well. If you've got a good one who already does that for you, great, stick with them. But if you don't, or you'd like a second opinion from one who does, maybe even Lance and his team there at Real Investment Advisors, um, then um, feel free to schedule a free consultation with one of the financial advisors endorsed by Wealthion. To do that, just go to Wealthion dot com fill out the short form there only takes you a couple of seconds uh you'll get a free consultation portfolio review from these guys they'll tell you what they think you should do you can take that information give it to your existing advisor you can do it yourself or you can continue talking to these guys if you like them but again it doesn't cost you anything there's no commitment to work with them it's just a public service that these guys offer to help as many people as they can all right lance and wrapping up here um i am going well first let me Remind folks that if you like these weekly market recaps that Lance and I do every week, want to see them continue, please support this channel by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Lance, I'll let you, uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, lead us out here. Anything else you want to say to folks as we wrap up here? Basically, just uh, sit tight. I think we got a little bit more corrective action to go through over the next couple of weeks. So, you know, don't be too fast to try to add equity exposure here. Just be a little bit patient. I think stocks are going to come back to you a bit. All right. Great. All right. With that, um, Lance, thanks so much. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.